Good afternoon my friends, this is Paul, and today I'm going to be re-reviewing Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door on the GameCube, this time with video footage and also without nostalgia glasses clouding my view of the game as was the case with my original review. Another added bonus is that I have now played every Paper Mario game that's come out except for Color Splash, so I have an appreciation of what came before and what came after, and yes, I have played Super Mario RPG, so I even know where the series officially started on the Super Nintendo. Paper Mario 2 has a design philosophy that is what really made me love Twilight Princess, and to this day still makes me consider that my second favorite Zelda game. It takes what worked in the original and perfects it. It preserves everything that doesn't need fixing, and if something doesn't work, it just tosses it out. Not so much on the latter, but we'll get around to that. Basically, Paper Mario 2 is Paper Mario 1, but with an all-new story and characters, and just everything is amped up to the nth degree. The story is more intense, the battles have more strategy, the music and graphics aren't quite as good, but... For the most part, this is a well-refined sequel that more or less is a director's cut of the original Paper Mario, just with a different story. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't know why the developers at Intelligent Systems thought that they had to keep reinventing the Paper Mario series, because in my opinion, it kind of just kept going downhill with Origami King being a step back in the right direction, but the series was never broken, as this game proved. So I kind of hope that they remastered this because boy do I have problems with it. But the problems are so minor that it's not going to stop me from recommending this to you. It's just going to say, don't think that this is a 10 out of 10 upper echelon masterpiece of game design, but it's mostly a 9.5 out of 10 upper echelon of masterful game design. So for starters, the original Paper Mario was a spiritual successor to Super Mario RPG on the Super Nintendo. Since the original Super Mario RPG was developed by Square, obviously it added Final Fantasy type elements to the Mario experience. So a Mario game that's turn-based and not a whole lot of platforming was a big departure from what Mario is used to. Paper Mario 1 more or less continued that formula, but with intelligent systems taking the reign as developers. So pretty much every character that was invented for Mario RPG was thrown out the window and you had an all-new cast. To further differentiate from Super Mario RPG, the series went in a whole new art style where just about everything was made out of paper. Now for the most part, this was mostly to reflect the aesthetic changes in the graphics, as there weren't a whole lot of paper jokes. I'm pretty sure there were only like two. For Paper Mario 2, they kind of took that in the literal extreme, where you get new abilities where Mario can use the form of his paper to turn into, say, an airplane or folding sideways so he can get through narrow gaps. The game even likes to make fun of this by having the person teaching you these paper abilities treat it as though you're being cursed into this new form, even though you're actually benefiting from his advice. Overall, the writing in Paper Mario 2 is phenomenal. It might just be the best in the series, as it's full of popular culture type of writing. The characters seem to speak in this like grungy American accent where they say words like crud a lot, which is stuff that you don't really hear nowadays. The setting is also much darker than what you're used to in the Paper Mario series. It's no longer just a colorful, let's go through the Mushroom Kingdom on an adventure to save the princess. Now, the opening town is an area full of criminals where one of the first sights you see is a hangman's noose. Then a couple of seconds later, you see the Mafia beating up people. Then, a couple of seconds later, you see a bandit that swipes half of your money, and then when you go to his hideout, in the original version of the game, they actually had an outline of a dead body. So this is definitely a much darker take on the Paper Mario story, but it's also a much funnier take to offset the darkness. You've got much more jokes, the characters tend to be more memorable and more likable, but, if a game was story alone, that would be pretty boring, and it would probably give Shigeru Miyamoto a headache. Now, it also refines the game's systems. Now, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get to every single change in this review, 
So let's first focus on what was changed in the battles. So it's still turn-based, you still select your options from a menu, and Mario is accompanied by one partner. Eventually you'll get more partners along the way, and you'll switch them out depending on the battle. There's not really a clear good or bad partner per se, as all of them have their strengths and weaknesses. For example, Goombella is really good at bopping on enemies and attacking them twice, however, her attack power is sort of split in half because she does her bop twice, and she also gets hurt if she jumps on enemies that have any kind of protection on their head, such as a spike or electricity. Then your second partner, Koops, is excelling at hitting enemies on the ground, and he also has added defense to ward off against enemy attacks. The downside is if he gets knocked over, he loses all of that defense, and he also can't attack enemies that are in the air. So in addition to Mario choosing between his hammer and his jump, you also have to figure out which partner is good for which occasion. The partners still more or less boil down to providing a mouth because Mario doesn't really talk a lot, and most of their character development is pretty much gone after you first meet them. So I definitely prefer Origami King's approach to the less companions, more development. But I do think that this was a step up from the original games, as when the characters do talk, they stand out a lot more. Like, Goombario, your initial partner, is more or less just Mario's helper. Goombella more or less fills that role as well, just with slightly different action commands. But what makes her stand apart is that she has sass, and she usually thinks just about everything is creepy. And sometimes she does a little bit of meta commentary on the Mario series as a whole, like wondering why chain, ch chain chomps never get tired when they're barking. It's like, I honestly wouldn't have thought of that if I hadn't heard Goombella say it. Another thing that Paper Mario 2 adds to the wrinkle is that the battles are on a literal audience. It was implied that Paper Mario 1 took place inside a storybook. So the next logical extreme for Paper Mario 2 is that it's not just a storybook, it's being played out in front of a live audience. Now this affects the battles in a big way, as the audience are going to react to how well you do in your action commands. Sure, you could fail an action command and still defeat the enemy, but that'll make the audience disappointed and you won't get as much star power. Star power is used to activate special moves that you get every time you get a crystal star, which are the Star Spirit MacGuffin replacements in Paper Mario 2. Now, unlike the Star Spirit moves, the special moves actually require skill to use, so you can't just select your Star Spirit from a menu and hope for the best. You have to perform the right button timing, you have to have the right energy, and so while it does make the system slightly more complicated than it was in Paper Mario 1, at the same time it feels like you're more in control of how much power you have over the enemies, as you kind of had to pray that some of the later attacks would actually hit and do damage to the enemies, whereas now you're pretty much reliant on your own skill. It also more or less makes the battles feel more satisfying because it takes more effort to beat them. And I would say that as a whole for Paper Mario 2's changes. There are some changes that initially really baffled me because it made it more complicated than the original. For example, now you have to pay coins to heal yourself at inns and heart blocks, whereas before you'd get them for free. But that also gives you an incentive to save your money if you're the type that splurges on all the items in the shops, and it also, ha it also gives coins more of a reason to exist. They're not just there like they are in most Mario games, they feel like they're valuable assets in this giant war against the powers of the darkness. And another big cool thing about the audience is that as you level up, the stage will get bigger and you'll have the capacity to have more audience members, which also triggers more effects. If the audience is booing you, then they'll throw items at you that can hurt you. And if you press X on time, Mario or your partner, whoever is active, will literally leap into the audience and attack the troublemaker. However, this can also backfire you as sometimes the audience can uh, throw helpful items and coins at you, and if you attack them, then you're losing out on that benefit. In addition, sometimes, say, a boo could come out of the audience and give an enemy an invincibility power-up. A daisy might sing all the audience members to sleep, and that'll make sure that you don't reap the benefits. The background scenery could fall over, 
or sometimes a smoke screen might appear that will make it so that both Mario and the enemies will have a harder time hitting each other. These systems kind of seem annoying at times because they don't really have a pattern for when they appear. You could be trying to figure out your next move and then an audience member is trying to pull a shenanigan on you and there's really not a way to pause the battle so that these don't happen. However, one thing that balances this out from being too frustrating is that they usually affect both Mario and the enemies, so there's not really someone that's clearly benefiting. And this goes for a lot of other changes too. I feel like I'm a broken record at this point, but Paper Mario 2 in some ways makes things more complicated, but in doing so also makes things more fair. Because in the original game, only Mario had the ability to use stuff like items and health points. Your partners could get damaged, but all it would really do is knock them out for a couple of turns. Now, you can choose whether Mario or his partner is in front, and each partner also has a unique life bar and has the ability to use items, which adds a whole new strategic wrinkle to who and where the enemy placement is. The enemies are also capable of carrying badges and items, which allows for them to have more unique strategies. So overall, it feels like the game is more complicated but more satisfying at the same time. So it's a perfect give and take from the original system. In addition to that, Paper Mario 2 just looks flat out gorgeous. It's not too much different in art style from the original Paper Mario besides just more paper effect, like the screen folding into a ball when you do a transition or the characters getting flattened more often, but overall this still looks really good. Like if this had come out today, I probably wouldn't have noticed besides the fact that it's in standard resolution. But thankfully to make up for the fact that it's on a non-HD system, this game is very colorful and the colors tend to be very bright and poppy. So in other words, a lot of times I actually forgot that I was playing a Paper Mario game that wasn't on the Switch, except for the really odd occasions when there would be slowdown in one particular room, then you'd get to another room and you'd be totally fine. And a lot of times there wasn't even a lot going on in that room. It would just be the opening to a dungeon with no enemies in sight. So I don't know why the game decided to slow down when it is, when it did. Um, now let's get on to the more negative aspects of Paper Mario's design. I think the area where Paper Mario 2 struggles the most is in the pacing, the backtracking, and also how it handles Peach and Bowser. So let's start with the latter option. Now in the original game you could control Princess Peach, and it was mostly relegated to her wandering around the castle and getting information to assist Mario from behind the scenes. This was a nice uh, way to subvert the expectations of the usual damsel in distress trope because while Peach was still kidnapped by Bowser, she wasn't just sitting there waiting for Mario to rescue her. She was actively taking a stand and providing assistance that would help him to rescue her. While she still does that here, there's a lot more corridor-like movements where Peach is more or less following the instructions of a computer, which leads to a lot more hilarious dialogue, but at the same time, the gameplay feels a lot more boring during her sections than it normally would. Occasionally, you'll get the handful of creative missions, such as Peach having to infiltrate into the bad guy's secret base, but it still boils down to just following instructions. In the original game, you had stuff like stealth missions, a quiz show, and lots of fun stuff to break up the action. That's not saying it's not here, but it just, it doesn't feel as much fun. The Bowser segments are a hoot because for once Bowser isn't actually the main villain and he actually is caught off guard that someone kidnapped Peach besides him. So he goes on his own quest, maybe this is more or less foreshadowing Bowser's inside story, to save the princess from her kidnapper but he never seems to get it right where Mario happens to be at at the moment, which leads to him revisiting former locations but with a Bowser twist. A couple of times Bowser will sometimes play through levels from the original Super Mario Brothers in his own style and paperized. And these are hilarious because they even have a points counter and the victory screen, which is all totally pointless, but it all just feels like it's a giant parody. 
The problem with these levels is that they're way too easy because Bowser has unlimited lives, and they're also over way too quickly and there's not enough of them. Honestly, I would love it if this were fleshed out into an entire concept, but again, this might have been a proof of concept for Bowser's inside story. Maybe if there is a way for the roles to be reversed, where Bowser was the one doing the side-scrolling, and you explored around a Mario location, that would be really cool. Next, let's get on to how the backtracking is handled. Now, this is primarily going to be a problem if you want to do the side quests, which are located at a place called the Trouble Center. You usually go to the booth to figure out what side quest you need to take, then you have to meet up with the partaker in the side quest, and then you have to do whatever they say, which usually involves returning to areas you've already been to, but since this game doesn't have a fast travel system, it's honestly kind of annoying, especially because Mario has lost the ability to spin like he did in the original Paper Mario, so he ends up feeling a lot more sluggish than he used to. Now, you do get a partner that lets you go faster, but this comes way too late in the game, and not only that, but by the time you do eventually get warp pipes that help you travel to the old locations more frequently, it's also inconsistent because you don't get warp pipes to every location like you did in the first Paper Mario, and instead you only get it to whatever is deemed most convenient. If you have to take a blimp somewhere, well obviously that doesn't make logical sense to take a warp pipe to the sky, so therefore we cannot have a warp pipe because that wouldn't make sense. However, the fact that there isn't a better system in place means that for once I'm actually disappointed that the game is being logical and instead doesn't opt for something more convenient. It also doesn't help that the majority of the cutscenes in this game you can't skip and even in the main missions it seems like there's backtracking for the sake of backtracking. One particular example in what I'll call the dark place to avoid spoilers is when you have to go to a haunted mansion to investigate the source of a trouble. Then, trouble happens to you, so you have to head all the way back to the town to figure out what to do. Then when you get back to the town and get assistance, then you have to go all the way back up to the mansion to go and fix the trouble. So it's like, um, why couldn't you just go to the mansion once and then have the ability to travel back to the town via, I don't know, Mario turning into a kite or something? That would fit with the paper aesthetic, and if this game is ever remade, I think that would be a great way to not only incorporate the paper, but also just make the game more convenient. I think this is actually one of the few areas where Paper Mario Sticker Star actually improved upon Thousand Year Door by providing the world map. Sure, it doesn't have the feeling of a cohesive world like this game does, but at least it's more convenient and doesn't lead to backtracking for the sake of backtracking. I also felt like that game didn't have as much repetition, where it was constantly introducing new ideas. And while Paper Mario 2 does that, it also has a habit of forcing things on you a lot just for the sake of providing another gag. Like in Chapter 3, when you have to keep registering for a match over and over and over again. You do this at least 20 different times, and they try to mix it up a little bit, but I feel like there could have been a much more efficient system, or at the very least a skip button so that you didn't have to see the same animation and the same dialogue over and over again. Now, if it seems like I'm nitpicking at Paper Mario 2, that's exactly what I'm doing. It is only a nitpick at the end of the day. Please do not let my complaints detract you from buying this game if you happen to be able to find it. Now, it's probably going to cost a pretty penny because it's on the GameCube, but I still think this is one of the most memorable adventures Mario has ever been on. And even though it does have troubles with pacing, Chapter 2 is just abysmal no matter how you look at it, and the backtracking can get really annoying, the battle system has been refined to a ridiculously good degree. The writing is spectacular. The final battle is so challenging and intense that it kind of makes the Bowser battles in the past look like a joke. And, perhaps best of all, this is a slap in the face to Shigeru Miyamoto hating story in Mario games, as there's quite a lot of hidden lore and depth to discover if you know where to look. Overall, I think Paper Mario 2 is a must-buy, and definitely the kind of game that does not feel like a byproduct of, ex of its time, with the exception of the lack of fast travel, the lack of auto-saving, and also some of the writing feels like it came straight from the early 2000s, which is totally fine, because 
it's better than usually the no writing at all that we get in games like Galaxy 2. So with that, thank you very much for watching. If I still somehow left something out in this whopping almost 20 minute review, let me know in the comment section. And until the next time, keep the faith, stay epic, God bless, and let's hope for a Paper Mario 2-2 in the future. Bye!